Okay, hi, Dei. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background? Hi, Dan. Um, thanks for contacting me. Yes, I'm Imam Dai Abdullah, and I am an executive director of Mecca Institute. I'm, a, I'm direct, executive director of Mecca Institute, which is a uh, Mecca Educational Center for Creative Academics. And we're an online, inclusive and progressive Islamic theological school. Okay, so now we'll move a little bit to questions about surrounding uh, the Orlando atrocity or massacre. Um, so the first of all, what kind of uh, message would you like to say to families and friends of the victims of the atrocity? Well, again, I, I acknowledge and send condol full condolences, sense of condolences to the families, the friends, and the communities there in Orlando. Um, and that, you know, the, the real issue here is that there's no need for violence, and violence is never the answer. And I want the people to know that I stand with them and honor the victims through the process of making certain that our communities coalesce together and stand against such issues when individuals decide that they must attack others who are different. Okay, so can you tell us a little bit how you understand what happened in, in the Pulse and also how it's been portrayed in the media? Well, um, coming to understand it as more and more information comes about, we have to continue to adjust um, until we find a very clear image of what's going on. But it was originally when I first heard it, being a black man in America, we, and being Muslim too, sometimes you go like, oh my God, let's hope they're not Muslim. Oh my God, I hope they're not a black person who did this. And so you get this sort of sinking feeling that happens. And so when I saw that, uh, it happened. I let you know the emotion flow through me so that I can move more quickly into how do we respond to this? How do we deal with these particular issues? Because this particular week, with the death of Muhammad Ali, who's a black man who exhibited what it really meant to be American and Muslim, his death, and I think it was really going to change how people thought about Muslims, even in this milieu of the Don, that Donald Trump has. And then to have this happen, and it allowed an eruption, though not as major as it could have been some years ago, but an eruption to where now people are want to use Islamophobia as a way to hate those people. And I think that um, we're not, they're not getting the response that I think that Donald Trump in particular wants to get. Maybe from his cronies and his followers, but from the other parts of America, he's not getting the response I think he's looking for. Yeah. And, and there's, there's been also a lot of uh, speculation in the media and misreporting linking um, the killer uh, Omar Mateen to ISIS and is that justified in your view? Well I don't think so necessarily think so because uh, when the FBI did investigations on him which they did twice uh, they never were able to find any connection of him being involved with such organizations and the people his wife who talked about him having um, some mental issues and also co-workers as well I think that this may point more directly to him having some type of mental health concerns and issues that may not have been dealt with and this may have led or helped trigger his response I mean, he was a police, uh, you know, security guard. He had access to guns and things of this nature because of his profession. But that didn't necessarily mean that most people who are security guards don't go around shooting people. So it means something else triggered that, and he happened to have access, and he utilized those tools to cause such harm and destruction. Yeah, of course, it it, um, it was indicated by both his wife and, and investigators that he was actually quite abusive uh, at home um, and um, had a lot of hate in him. So it, it sounds like uh, a mental health issue or, or some, some form of emotional conflict, as you said. Uh, and then I would like to throw something else in, out there too, 
is that uh, when his father mentioned that he had seen two men kissing and it had caused him, uh, he became extremely upset about it. Not that this may necessarily be true and it may turn out, but in Muslim society, sometimes men and women who are LGBTQ are forced into marriages, forced marriages. And if that's the case, he, it may have been an issue of him not being able to be who he really was, which is he might have been a gay person and struggling with that issue and then covering it up, but with the marriage process. And in my counseling that I've done, pastoral counseling, I've done a number of men who, who were forced into marriages. Some of them admit, admitted they had become abusive towards their wives. So this may be a, a hidden factor that may reveal itself later. Yeah, yeah. And and there's been a lot of speculation, quite negative speculation on the media, immediately linking Islam to what happened. What, what is your response to that? Well, if, just because one can easily let ISIS or Daesh roll off their lips doesn't mean that there's any cognitive connection between those two things. And the media, of course, and as we know from journalism, the rule of journalism, you know, um, dog biting a man is not normal, but a man biting the dog is. So they're looking for something to titillate, to bring people to their particular website in social media terms. And so I think that they just e too easily associate people, Muslim, thus Islam, thus equals ISIS. And it's, they're, they're, there's not a real nexus in each one of those. Yeah, of course, what you say is corroborated by that, you know, previously he swore allegiance to al-Nusra and to uh, Hezbollah, which are totally opposed to ISIL or Daesh. So, you know, he didn't really, it seems, uh, have any strong allegiance to any group and rather, you know, what you said, an emotional conflict he has, uh, whatever underpins it, uh, he just try to find some justification for it rather than it being the other way around, Islam being motivating him, whether a mental health issue or a conflict is motivating him. Yeah. I think another thing just on the mental health issue is just that in within Muslim context, the you know, social media um, the idea of mental health issues, they people don't necessarily want to deal with it really easily or deal with it in such a way because there's a shaming and, and the ostracization and ostracizing um, in terms of people um, being put out of the community or considered shameful in the family context. So that's something that really needs to be considered too in terms of Muslim practitioners utilizing um, more modern techniques and letting the Quran be a source of comfort, but not a source of cure. So let's move to the Quran then, since you mentioned the Quran. What is the position of the Quran on same-sex desire? There is no position. <laughs> so that's the thing about it. Within the text itself, there's nothing that says anything. And where it does have any, con any connotation of, of sexuality, it would be in the the the, 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 the surah nur and that would run in the same position it talks about marriage that men should not should lower their gaze and not gawk at women women um, should uh, you know cover themselves and, and you know present themselves appropriately in front of men who are not related to them and then in that same concept of those men that says men who have no desire for women Though the, the, the scholars will say that, oh, well, that just means those people are asexual, but I don't think so, because there are men who don't have desire for women, but they do have desire for men. And then in the next verse in 2432, it talks about Mary from the single among you. And then in the Qurans that you find that come out of the Gulf, it says in parentheses, male and female, close parentheses, when the Arabic doesn't say that. And it says, Mary from the single among you, even if it's among righteous male and female slaves. And then the, you know, the, the, the Islamic law issue in Sharia 
is that whoever there's another part in the Quran that talks about possession, whoever possesses by the right hand. And there have been historical legal issues where men want to have sex with their male slaves and women want to have sex with their female slaves. And so, you know, of course, it, it, it's viewed as being not, not, not something good by the, the Wahhabis and Salafists, but it was something that people were allowed to do in some instances in some cultures. So, yeah, so it's a matter of interpretation, like hadith and different schools of thought within Islam. Um, can you elaborate a little bit about just that shortly, <laughs> briefly? Well, one of, the, one of the problems with the hadith, and many scholars say there's less than 100 of them that really have good, strong historical foundation, but those other 4,900 4, that you find in Bukhari are just folklore. And it's within that, that folklore that you find certain combinations of a hadith that support domination and control by, by a dynasty. You find women um, subjugated to abuse from, under patriarchy and also that um, demonization of uh, sexual diversity. So it's a variety of things you'll find there, but a lot of that relates to culture and people who may have taboos in their culture, and they came into the collection of the Hadith through that process. Yeah, so it's it's obviously a matter of how you interpret the text and which interpretation is promoted by whom. Um, and, and let's talk a little bit and about- And what time frame. And what time frame, of course. We'll, yes, we'll, we'll right. get to that. Um, but let's let us let us talk about now, how, how generally about being Muslim and gay. A lot of Muslims, even gay Muslims and or LGBTI Muslims, think that it they have a choice to make. Either they are open about their sexuality and reject their faith, or they uh, suppress their sexuality and uh, go for the faith. But you're clearly saying there's other ways. So can you talk about that? Well, I can, yes. I think that when people are confronted with that issue, they're really confronted with the aspect of stepping outside of the tribal or clan standards, meaning that everyone should do these kinds of things. They, they know best for each individual. And when a person becomes more individualized or seek to do things because as an individual they want to do so, then there's pushback. Um, so uh, some of them do so out of a need to be a member of the group. Those who may be in more modern circumstances, like in the West, they have an opportunity after school or if they afford, can afford to do so, they can become independent. And in some instances, over time, lessen their connection with their family tribal groups. But those who are not, particularly young people, they're frequently caught between the hard place and the rock of that, how do I deal with this? And sometimes they're, because of their lack of a, knowledge, lack of understanding, and lack of, of the cultural places that they're in, the context, that they will go along with getting married, going to a forced marriage, and then find years later that they've been very unhappy, and then maybe divorce, or at the end of, the, the, of, of raising children, they divorce and then find themselves in their own sexual orientation. Okay, so obviously, you mentioned just before this question I posed that there has been uh, a different tradition in Islam. Um, so can you tell us if you draw inspiration from past Muslim scholars, poets, and even caliphs, which were to some degree open about their sexuality? Well, of course. I mean, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I think that the issue of, of um, same gender um, sexual relationships has existed and did exist at the time of the prophet and that there was no problem with it in terms of as long as a person was a, had ethics and dealt with being ethical in their relationships, I think there was never an issue associated with that. But when we move into uh, further Islamic history, um, after uh, the dyna dynastic system reinstituted itself, you know, 35 years after the prophet's death, I think we then start having those representations where people were doing what they wanted to do, but also did it with the power and support 
of those um, Islamic religious leaders too.